All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Market Matters. My name is Katie Kuntz, and I'm a social media editor here at CNBC. Today, I'm joined by CNBC's senior markets correspondent, Bob Bassani, and we're going to be answering all of your questions about the latest stock market moves. Nice to see you, Bob. Well, Katie, happy new year. I think we've talked since the, since the new year. Yeah, first one, kicking off 2023. How, how's it been going for you so far? Well, it's uh, it's an interesting <laughs> year with a lot of um, a lot of hope. I think people are very surprised that we're getting a market rally. Sentiment was terrible going into the uh, end of the year, and of course, uh, guess what? <laughs> Market's up. Uh, we can talk about why that's happening, but that's kind of the main story uh, going into the new year. Yeah, for sure. So let's jump right into it. A lot to chat about today. Um, first things first, banks like JP Morgan and Citigroup kicked off earnings season uh, this morning. So what's the takeaway so far? Well, there's two ways you can look at this. One is the sort of no nerdy way you look at bank earnings. So loan growth, for example, loan growth is OK. Um, uh, these are investment banks you like, you know, uh, Citigroup's JP Morgan's the Bank of America's. Uh, so they look at metrics like trading, which seem OK. Um, what we call investment banking is not great. Um, you know, the IPO business has been terrible. Then banks, these investment banks, they make a lot of money on IPOs. Mergers and acquisitions have not been very good either. So that's kind of down, but that's already been expected. I think overall, the numbers are OK. Uh, what is really going on is a broader picture. People are looking at these banks because the big question is, what kind of slowdown are we going to have? So they're using uh, loan loss reserves as proxies for whether or not the economy is going to slow down. So these banks have enormous loans out. They have commercial loans. They have private loans. They have credit card loans out. And when banks think things are going to slow down, they'll take what are called provisions. They'll add to their loan losses that they potentially think that are going to happen down the road. They haven't actually happened. They're just saying, we're going to set aside another billion dollars just in case we have an increase in bad loans going down the road. So people are using this as a proxy for how serious they think there's going to be an economic slowdown. So we saw them today. And what happened today was they increased their provisions for potential loan losses down the road, but they didn't increase them by much. So this is that soft landing thing. You know, we're going to see a slowdown, but it's not going to be that bad. So far, that's fine. I think that's one of the reasons that Banks have started lifting in the middle of the day. People are realizing this news is not really um, that bad. So um, higher loan loss, but not much higher signaling. I think for the moment, um, we are not expecting, at least the banks are not expecting a dramatic decline in the economy. Most are appearing to be in the slowdown camp, but not dramatic. So, Bob, we heard from banks today. Um, is there anything else that you're watching as earnings season begins? Well, the big story here is, I think, is going to be margins in 2023. So what's margins? Margins is how much of a profit do you get to keep. And margins have been historically high um, last year uh, and in 2021. Um, so it, it, gross uh, operating margins, bottom line margins, uh, have been as high as 13% for the S&P 500. This is on aggregate. The, 500 companies. Uh, historically, your profit margin, again, this is how much profit you get to keep, has been 9% or so. It started going up in 2007, 8, 9. Uh, it got better. It got as high as 11%. That's pretty good. I mean, think about it. You got to see, keep 11% of everything. And it got as high as 13% in 2020 and 2021. Um, it's been coming down. But obviously, the more money you get to keep, the better it helps your bottom line, obviously. you know. So, uh, what is going on this year is I think that demand is still going to be good, but there, the, the, there's going to be cost pressure. So think about these companies. They've been raising prices to deal with all of the supply chain issues and higher wages and things, and they're getting to the limits of where they can do it. So a really good example today is the airlines are down. Delta reported Delta Airlines and demand's good. People are flying like crazy. The prices are stupid. Go try going on a plane somewhere. It's amazing how expensive it is for an airline ticket or particularly for hotels. Don't even get me started on hotel costs. They're crazy. Um, so demand was still strong, they said, but labor costs were higher. They're paying more for pilots. They're paying more for, for everything. So the guidance that they gave, while the, the demand is high, 
the guidance was light because their costs are up. So the stock's been trading down today. So higher labor costs are going to be an issue. That's margin pressure. Uh, another issue is how far can these companies push these price, price hikes? I mean, you're, you're got to be unconscious if you don't notice that the price, go to a restaurant, go buy a Hershey's bar uh, compared to three years ago. Um, and company are reporting, we're starting to see some pushback and it's about time, frankly. So for example, Constellation Brands, they make, they make beer. They said people are pushing back against beer price hikes. Even Hershey's, even Hershey's has said uh, that they are very mindful of um, what they call price elasticity or inelasticity. That's just a fancy word meaning how far can we push prices up before people say, you know what? You can keep your chocolate bar. So think about this. Just be a normal person. If chocolate bar is a dollar and you raise it one year because you say the costs are high to a dollar four, dollar five, yeah, you probably get away with it. Next year you raise it to a dollar nine. Maybe the next year you go to a dollar fifteen or dollar eighteen. Some people are just to say, you know what? Forget about it. And we're kind of reaching that limit right now. That's margin pressure too, because if if they just if the cost still going up more than they thought and they can't raise the prices, well, their profits are going to go down. You see, and that's what moves the stock market. Duh. So uh, I think the big story of this year is going to be these margin pressures these companies uh, are, are going to have. That's what you really want to watch. Delta today is down because of that. So, Bob, stocks have been generally rallying in January um, after a pretty poor close to 2022. Um, so what's behind the rally? Well, there's this <laughs> one of my favorite things on Wall Street. I call it the pain trade. So remember, people engage in hurting behavior. You know, people make in my book, uh, Shut Up and Keep Talking, I discuss behavioral economics and biases that people have. One of the big things that happens is this herd behavior. So think about what happened at the end of 2022. The sentiment was terrible. We kind of drooped into 20 at the end of December there because people were thinking, you know, the earnings are probably going to be down because I talked about the cost pressures. We don't know what kind of um, what kind of economy we're going to have. So what kind of uh, what side of the soft landing are you on? Are we going to have a, 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 a serious recession, a modest recession, just a soft landing? We don't, don't, nobody knows. The opinions are all over the place. And because of that, it's really difficult to do any kind of real um, forecasting. So the general sentiment has been shitty, frankly, that's a technical word, going into 2023. Um, and so what happens, there's this thing called the pain trade. Um, the pain trade is what is the trade that would cause the greatest number of pain to the greatest number of people? This is a and the pain trade would be the market rallies. Why? Because everybody is positioned for the market to do shitty in 2023. So if the market starts wrong in 2023, that would cause the greatest number of pain. The pain trade has happened. It's up. Now, a lot of people will dismiss this and say, oh, this is seasonal flows, which are usually happen. And that's true. But there's been some pretty strong moves, particularly in the stuff that's badly beaten up last year, like Kathy Wood's ARC stuff is having a very good start. So it's a little more than seasonal flows. Um, uh, so th this is very tough to figure out with 2023. You, you don't have years where you're dealing with the after effects of a pandemic, a, a ground war in Russia, and the Federal Reserve raising interest rates faster than they had in decades. That's really tough to figure out. And uh, the market had a terrible, people don't want to remember this, but it, the stock market was, most of the damage in the stock market was in the first half of 2022 last year. It basically went fell apart from January uh, into June and kind of mired around in the muck for the second half of the year. So the market anticipated a lot of bad news, particularly in technology stocks. You saw what happened to Amazon and Meta. Now, the game now is they're trying to gain the second half of the year. So all of this stuff about, you know, potential higher costs, you know, we've got a sense of that, but it's not clear. Uh, earnings estimates have been cut for a lot of tech names rather dramatically um, already. And we're trying to figure out what's going to look like in the second half of the year. And that's where it's getting really tough. When you're dealing with big rate hikes and we, it's really hard to figure out 
the influence of a big rate hike like this. It's not good. I mean, the Fed went to nothing to four and a quarter to four and a half, and they'll probably raise, you know, the, the Fed funds rate to five percent or close to it in the next few quarters. And the question is, do they stay there? How long do they stay there? Do they go any higher? Do they drop? The market seems to think they're going to blink in the second half of the year. Maybe. There's a diversity of opinions. It's really tough to figure out. And that's why you have people with earnings estimates all over the place. I know strategists who think earnings in 2023 are going to be up 10%. I know them who think they'll be down 20%. I mean, up 10, down 20, That's you can drive a truck through that. That's not very useful. That signals what I call cluelessness. Not cluelessness because they're stupid, cluelessness because it's really hard to model this right because it can go in a lot of different directions because the U.S. economy is ridiculously complicated. And nobody can really figure out these things very well. I've said this so many times, nobody's very good at forecasting the future. Amateur stock pickers are terrible. Professional stock pickers are terrible. Economists are terrible at predicting the economy. The Federal Reserve has a terrible track record at predicting the economy. If you don't notice that, you're not paying attention. It has. It goes to the unknowability, the difficulty in forecasting when there are millions of different variables. And the farther out you go, the worse it gets. So you get very humble uh, about this. And this is why people like Jack Bogle talked about staying long and having a plan and not trying to figure out when you go into the market and go out of the market. Yeah, there are definitely so many different factors kind of up in the air right now, um, but it'll be interesting to watch what happens with the Fed as we go farther into 2023 and stocks, of course, as well. So, Bob, you've said that 2023 um, could be another record year for dividend payouts. Why is that and what does that mean for investors? Yeah, I wrote about this week and I love dividends because they're boring, but they're an absolute key to long-term investing success. Um, I did a story on my Trader Talk blog, which I do every day, by the way, if those of you want to look at it, it's tradertalk.cnbc.com. It's now up behind the pro paywall, but it's worth it. <laughs> tradertalk.cnbc.com. And the reason I like dividends is it's boring and it's a very important way of building long-term wealth. So uh, I did a look back at the S&P 500 since 1926, almost 100 years. And on average, the S&P goes up about 10% a year. Now that is total return. A total return is the price plus the dividends. And the story about dividends is that you reinvest them. And reinvesting dividends creates compounding interest growth. And this is one of the great miracles in the world, compounding interest. So the, the S&P overall returned a 1.7% dividend. So if you put $1,000 in the, the, you know, uh, the S&P 500, you got um, $17 back in dividends last year. So that doesn't sound like much. People say, who cares about, you know, 2% dividend. That doesn't mean anything. Actually, it's very important because if you reinvest that money, you compound it year over year. So of that 10% increase every year in, in the last 100 years, of the, of the money you would have accumulated, about 60% of the money you would have accumulated comes from the price increase. 40% comes from the dividends reinvested. So a very, very important part of stock market wealth comes about by reinvesting dividends. Now, obviously, not everybody reinvests the dividends. Some people just take the cash, but you do get cash, okay? It's not the same re total return as if you invested it. In other words, if every year I said, give me my 1.7% in cash, I'm going to go, you're still getting 1.7% yield, but you're not going to get the compounded interest that would have made really big long-term wealth. So- uh, it's very important to understand getting rich slow, which is what dividends are. Get rich slow and very important to understand the power of compounding interest. And I discussed this in my book. Jack Bogle became very famous for the founder of Vanguard describing how a small amount of money, $1,000 in the S&P and it's 1.7% dividend. Don't sound like much, but do that over 10, 20, 30 years. The numbers get very, very big towards the end. And that's what you want to look for the long term, 30, 40 years out. And it really is quite impressive. I throw some numbers in the book. Bogle has it. Other people do as well. 
Uh, so, Bob, our last question here. I was wondering if you could talk about some books that you would recommend for investors. Well, I did another story on this um, recently. Two very old friends of mine had new editions out of my favorite books. Um, and again, I discussed this in my in my book. Back when I became the stocks correspondent in the mid-90s, um, I was the real estate part correspondent. And one of the things I, I did to prepare to be the stocks correspondent was look around and see what books kind of mattered. And when I wrote my new, my new book, ultimately, I realized there were only half a dozen books that really, truly influenced me and that I still use today. Um, and I, I did a story on Trader Talk on this, but I'll tell you the four of them. Um, the first is um, Burton Malkiel's Random Walk Down Wall Street. Burton Malkiel was one of the very first people 50 years ago. This is the 50th anniversary, just came out edition uh, to identify the fact uh, that uh, an index fund, simply being able to own the market would be the most efficient way to be a long-term investor. There weren't any index funds back then. Uh, Jack Bogle didn't open the S&P 500 fund until 1974 or five, but Malkiel was one of the first people to identify that. So I would that would be first, new additions out, a random walk down Wall Street. Second would be Jeremy Siegel's book from Wharton School, um, Stocks for the Long Run. That book came out in 1994, just out in a brand new edition. He did groundbreaking research into long-term returns on stocks and bonds going back to the early 1800s. When I say that 10% return is the average for the S&P, he did that kind of research uh, showing why you want to own stocks in the long term, why they may not be great returns in the short term, but in the long term, they are the best kind of long-term return. So that would be number two, stocks for the long run. There's two other books that I would mention that are um, uh, Charlie Ellis's Winning the Losers Game out a uh, new edition about a year and a half ago. Uh, Ellis, like Burton Malkiel, I identified early on in the 1970s uh, that active funds, for the most part, do not outperform the market and for the most part, do not justify their fees. This was groundbreaking research, even though we knew active management had been doing poorly since the 30s. That book, Common, uh, Winning the Losers Game, was very, very important in doing that. So I'd say that was number three, Charlie Ellis' Willing Losers Game. And then finally, Jack Bogle, um, uh, the man who had probably the biggest influence on me, the founder of Vanguard. Uh, his famous book, Common Sense on Mutual Funds, was out in 1999, and then a new edition in 2009, an updated edition. Um, and that was the last one. Jack unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Uh, but he outlines his basic concepts in that book which, which are uh, staying long, uh, not doing market timing. Market timing doesn't work for most people. You have to be right going in and going out. Um, and he showed how you, you need to have a plan and you need to stay invested. And by and large, index investing is the way to go. So all of these have common themes, these four books. But it's, you know, when, it, when I talk about PE ratios and, you know, what matters in the market and, and dividend investing, um, all of this goes back essentially to those four books. Even today, that they're on my shelf back here, and I still refer to them. They're my reference books. Uh, and most of what I know uh, when I look back and thought about my career comes from those four books. I would, I won more Robert Schiller's Irrational Exuberance, which came out in 2000, talks about behavioral economics um, and talks about um, the, the impact of irrational investing on the markets. And that was very important. To me, that helped uh, open my eyes to be the role of irrational uh, behavior in this in the stock market, um, and we're all today much more aware uh, of what we now call behavioral economics than we used to be um, 20 25 years ago when I started in the mid uh, 1990s in the stock market. So I'd highly recommend those. I know that sounds like a lot of uh, reading to do, uh, but check out my my Trader Talk blog. It sort of summarizes what each of them. Uh, has to, has to say. Yeah, and I'll share a link to Bob's Trader Talk story that lists um, those books um, on our Twitter account, so definitely check that out. And Bob, I thought it was interesting, you recently spoke with uh, Burton Malkiel, and he said that his belief in index investing is stronger than ever, so it kind of just shows you, you know, the power that this has. Yeah, Burton is, uh, it's, it's so great that he got a new edition of the book out. I mean, how often can you say this is the 50th anniversary edition? I mean, that's really something to say, um, and it's, it's just wonderful 
you know, some of this sounds kind of boring that we keep saying, you know, about dividends reinvesting, but a lot of investing is just having a plan and sticking with it. It's not thinking that you can trade your way out of things. You can't. Uh, and you have to be comfortable with that. And that's why people like uh, Bogle would always say, look, we know people think they want to beat the market and they're going to outsmart the market. And it's fun. It's like sports betting. But don't generally do it for most of the money. Even, even Bogle used to say, okay, you think you're a genius? You think you can beat the market? Go ahead. Take 10% of your money and go ahead and you know, buy something or buy a fund. Uh, but you're going to probably find out if you're honest in the way you do it, account for all the costs and the time that you're spending, you're probably not going to beat the market. Well, thank you, Bob, for answering all of our questions. Thank you to everyone for tuning in again for another week of Market Matters. And we wish you all a great 2023. Thanks, guys. Look forward to chatting. Thanks, Bob.